All right, hey everyone, and uh, welcome to today's Prometheus Group webinar that poses a really important question. Is digital permitting safe? My name is Derek Schickel, and I'm the Sales Engineering Manager for North America here at Prometheus Group, and joining me today is our Senior Functional Consultant, Sean McWhorter. Thanks to everyone who's able to join us live today. We'll be covering some very important topics and we're really excited to share with you. Now, as we go through everything, please feel free to ask questions using the chat function. And while we may not get to all of those immediately during the webinar, we will have a Q&A portion for a few minutes at the end where we'll do our best to answer any questions you may have. So today we'll be going through a brief introduction to Prometheus Group. Uh, we'll be doing some uh, discussions on permitting and isolation. And Sean will be going through a, a story-based demonstration where we're going to talk about a lot of great things that we've observed and a lot of trends in the industries. But I want to start out by briefly introducing Prometheus Group. We were founded in 1998 and are headquartered here in Raleigh, North Carolina. We also have a global presence with locations represented on the map shown here. Our mission is to simplify and streamline enterprise asset management and to optimize maintenance and operations through the use of our integrated and intuitive solutions. Now, as you can see here, you're in really good company as a user of Prometheus Group Solutions. Uh, this is just a glimpse of some of our incredible companies that utilize and trust our Prometheus Group software. You can see multiple industries represented that you saw on the previous slide, and we're going to share some stories and successes in multiple industries today. Now, to discuss the Prometheus platform, uh, time to kind of take a wider angle view of everything in the, in the Prometheus Group suite of solutions. The Prometheus platform is a gateway for information to really flow from different groups in your organization, whether it be projects, operations, maintenance, safety, all connected to your ERP system, keeping that single source of truth. Uh, we have unparalleled integration that exists between different modules of our platform. You know, for example, our permitting solution can connect to multiple systems, multiple CMMSs and ERPs, and also has a mobile aspect that can connect to SAP, Maximo, Prometheus Operator Rounds, Prometheus and Tempo, and of course, your integrated safe system of work, ePass, just to name a few of the integration examples. All the company's different user groups can use the same application while connecting to different systems. Today, we'll be going through the permitting and isolations module of our platform, but keep in mind we have other integrated solutions, so be on the lookout for announcements on, on additional webinars or reach out to let us know you want to see more. Send us a message and we'll have somebody here personally reach out. Now, a perfect example of the Prometheus platform breaking down barriers and removing information silos within a corporation is the Prometheus ePass workflow. Everyone knows how difficult it is to get two departments here represented to align. We often hear paths shown here referred to as swim lanes. Well, Sean and I have been places where these departments aren't even in the same swimming pools. With Prometheus platform and what the Prometheus platform enables, and specifically ePass today, is a free flow of information where applicable while pulling the single source of the truth. The technology in the Prometheus platform enables the crossover between the swim lanes so that full transparency and optimal efficiency can be achieved. Now, digital permitting is something that has been discussed a lot lately in these industries, but today we wanna to explore, does merely going digital with your permitting truly make you safe? Now with that, I'm gonna hand it off to our senior functional consultant, Sean McWhorter, will be taking us through some very interesting topics, sharing industry stories, and doing some live demonstrations pertaining to permitting and isolations. Sean? Thanks, Derek. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us uh, this morning for us, afternoon, depending on where you're coming from. So we got a few different examples I wanted to talk through, a few different use cases that Derek, myself, a lot of our colleagues have seen throughout our time working with EPATS, uh, working with other safe work management solutions and how they tie in to the Prometheus platform. So, you know, this screen here, this, this ePass workflow, we're going to talk about a few different touch points here with respect to risk assessments, with respect to the different handoff points, how we're trying to streamline those, how are those becoming more efficient or do they, if we're talking about going digitally. You know, how can isolation management, how can searching for these isolations or performing these be affected in a digital solution? And finally, how, do, how does the feedback loop work with everything? All right, does this change how our safety data is siloed or affected or how that can 
be integrated with the overall asset management process. So the first thing I want to take a look at is how can risk assessments affect permitting, right? So when we start thinking about whether or not digital permitting is safe, let's start thinking through some of the existing paper permitting processes. So one of the things that's really commonly associated with paper permitting, but not necessarily a part of it, is the risk assessment. So what is a risk assessment? That's, you know, we're reviewing tasks present for a job and we want to collectively determine hazards present, mitigating controls, and if that's presenting an acceptable risk tolerance for us to be able to perform this work. So in mining, for example, and this is true in several, several other industries, if we're doing certain types of work, we have certain hazards present, we're almost always going to require a risk assessment or hazard assessment of some, in some way, shape, or form be performed. But what does this really have to do with the work permit? Right, oftentimes in a paper process, our work permits, we're using them to authorize work and the risk assessments are controlling how are we measuring the safety of this job. So these two documents are working in conjunction to help us achieve the same thing, but the only thing that's really telling us, do we need a risk assessment, do we not, is oftentimes a checkbox on a paper permit or individual training or just individual knowledge as we're going through and deciding you know, is there a potential risk? How are we going to evaluate this risk? Is this something we need an auxiliary assessment for? So that's just thinking about how do we even determine whether or not we need risk assessments. In addition to this, we should also think about how are we evaluating these risk assessments, right? One of the things that's always an area of concern that's always difficult is how can we make our people more consistent in how they want to evaluate risk and how we should control those risks we're evaluating, right? Consistency in every industry is really tough to manage and maintain. If Derek and I were going to go and fill out a risk assessment right now without any sort of structure in place, I can almost guarantee you that we're going to come back with different results. And that's something that I've heard every single place I go on site. All right, so once we fill out these risk assessments too, what are they doing to help us affect our future risk assessments? How are they driving change? How are they improving our safety? Or is it something where if we do unfortunately have incidents? Are we just adding another process to what we're already doing on paper? So one of the things that EPASS lets you do is it, it helps you create consistency with your risk assessments. You're going to see what we call the HIRA here in a little bit, our hazard identification and risk assessment. And that's just building on a library of collective knowledge that you have on your site. So this makes you much more consistent. Uh, it allows you to be more efficient. And our customers across all industries are recognizing more hazards and controls when they're using a tool like this. In addition to being more consistent, you're also able to incorporate the risk assessment process into your permits. So you'll be able to see how these risk assessments can help mandate what type of permit do we need, what type of approvals are required, what type of other auxiliary isolations or lockout tagout management is required, and how does that affect the other safety processes we have to undergo. Finally, it's much easier to build out in a digital system. If you want to talk about you know, changing your risk assessment or even changing your permit process when you're on paper, that takes a lot of time. That takes a lot of approval because you have limited real estate with how you can define those risks. If you're using a, a HIRA, you're using a digital system like ePass, you can continually update and continually manage the type of work activities, hazards, uh, and how we want to mitigate those hazards within the system. So you're always being job specific. You're always able to define how we want to control safety for a lot of these different aspects. And while Sean's getting this pulled up, I want to reiterate a couple of things that he mentioned that are very important. Uh, he mentioned, you know, the risk assessments and how no one should be better than someone else at a certain type. You know, Sean shouldn't be the guy we go to for heavy lift risk assessments. I shouldn't be the confined space guy. This should not be a creative exercise in filling out these risk assessments. These should be pulling from that collective knowledge database that Sean is mentioning, and uh, look forward to showing you some of that live in our system right now. 
Absolutely. So we're just going to go through a quick portion of ePass, how ePass can handle risk assessments, and then later on we'll show you if there is a scenario where we need a more formal risk assessment, you're able to reference that directly from the permit. So right here you're seeing the home screen of Prometheus ePass. That's our electronic permit administration system. We have a variety of different ways to log into the system. I'm just using good old-fashioned username and password, but we can use single sign-on. You can have badge authentication. One of the things to note is once I log in, my home screen changes significantly. So you can have shortcuts configured to yourself, to your role, to make sure that you have quick access to lists of what we're defining, both from an approval standpoint, what's live, what have we recently worked on, what templates can we leverage to copy other pre-approved values, what have we completed already, what's expired. We can even take a visual representation and let me take a look at where are all the permits currently active throughout site right now and show that to me in a, in a spatial overview like this. Each of these wrenches, this is telling me here's a work party throughout site. The different colors, these are different work types. So you could, if you wanted to, you could have a red icon for hot work. You could have a blue icon for your standard work, a gray for minor work, you know, green for excavation. And that's entirely up to you. ePass is a highly configurable solution, as you'll see. And it's something that is really meant to fit inside your current workflow process and improve upon the processes and safety mandates you're trying to put in place. And this visualization of, of what's happening at your plan is something that just truly cannot be achieved with a paper-based process. Uh, being able to, to plot, uh, use different technologies to, to show spatially where work is occurring in relation to each other. Of course, EPAS has controls in place to keep conflicting types of work from happening in the same area, but sometimes it's just a proximity issue. And getting a graphical view of, a, of what's happening in the big picture is extremely valuable uh, for folks when deciding what to do and, and what decisions to make moving forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And one last thing to point out before we start filling out the permit, show you how the risk assessment's tied in. You can also see these action indicators here letting us know that we have a couple of permits that are active within close proximity. So this is something where you can be warned of potential conflicts for simultaneous operations. There's a lot of smarts built into the system, a lot of different cross-referencing, conflict management and spatial management uh, to make sure that we're trying to define and evaluate all of this information as necessary. All right, so a couple of questions I want to take really quickly here uh, as we're going through the legend. You can expand out here. You can see the different icons uh, for the colors with how this pertains to different type of work. You can also see those flags if things are nearing expiration or have already expired. Another question on how we know, how do we know this location, right? Is it GPS or based on the SAP functional location uh, or the Maximo location or Maximo assets? And the answer is it really depends on how you want to define this. What we do as a starting point for most of our customers is we'll load in some CAD images. They can be 2D or 3D, and you can put pinpoints on where are people working. So it's physically dropping that in. Now that's really easy to implement, uh, but it is something that's part of your workflow process. We can also integrate with other GIS and other geospatial systems out there to more automatically map where are people throughout site. So if you have systems like that in place already, we can integrate with that uh, and work with that type of mapping or if you don't, it's something we can put as an area of growth and we can start off with some CAD drawings and you can just point and click really easily on where everyone's going to be performing work. Exactly, and, and Prometheus ePass, of course, being a web-based solution really opens the doors for a lot of great integration with other systems. So if you have a current geospatial or GIS system in place, uh, you know we have the, the development team, we have uh, the tools and the access points in place in ePass to make those connect. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's start building out a permit. There's a lot of ways to start this. You can do permit requests. That's where, you know, your maintenance contractors, other operators might submit from a kiosk or a mobile device. You know, maybe we need a permit. We want to start this off with a request. 
We can incorporate this with your maintenance system. Work orders, tasks, operations. Those can submit permit requests to our system. So our operators, maintenance, or our safety personnel, whoever is really responsible for writing and signing off on the majority of your safe work activities, they can then evaluate and update as necessary. So what I'm doing right now, uh, you know, let's say if I was in, if I was in chemicals, oil and gas, uh, a lot of other, you know, really uh, heavy plant environments, oftentimes it's going to be your operators who are going to be filling out the majority of your permits. Mining, it's often more of a maintenance responsibility. Either way, it's, it's something where you can provision access as necessary in the system. So I'm going to choose to create a permit. Uh, we're going to be doing, you know, a new permit for work, and maybe it's something where, you know, we have hot work for this particular permit that we're going to be doing. Maybe we're welding or, you know, doing grinding or some type of work that's going to introduce heat, whatever we're working on. Now, the value you have from those other request types is it can help mandate what type of permit do you need. Now, me, since I'm one of our primary permit writers, I can just skip that and go and choose directly the type of permit I'd like. The permit to work is going to be the standard for most of the work. You can see we have a pretty exhaustive list here, but one thing that's true across all industries we work in is that none of our customers have a list that is even half this long. It's something that we want to make sure this is simplified uh, and make sure that we have you know, built into the HIRA, built into the workflow, the ability to create the types of permit you're expecting to see throughout site. Exactly. And, and you'll notice as you saw that list, uh, you know, different type, potentially different nomenclature than what you're used to. This EPAS solution, amongst others in the Prometheus platform, is extremely configurable. So if you see terminology that doesn't quite line up, EPAS works with multiple industries in multiple regions of the world. So if we weren't configurable, then we wouldn't be able to meet all these different customers' requirements. So uh, as we go through the discussion today, uh, just keep that in mind, that terminology is going to be uh, uh, what you're familiar with upon implementation. Right, and not even just regional, just different industries, right? That's that's the thing that's really unique about EPAS. It's it's prevalent in oil and gas. It's prevalent in mining and metals. It's prevalent in manufacturing, pulp and papers, chemicals. There are tons of industries that we work with, and, and we would not be able to do so if we could handle the configuration uh, of these different workflows. So the left-hand side, you see different tabs. These are, of course, configurable. The right-hand side, you're going to see the content we want to fill. This red box here with the number, that's equivalent to how many required fields do we have for this particular permit. So I'm going to fill out this information, the work group, who's doing this hot work, what area are we going to be doing this hot work in, and then just to close the loop on some of the imaging questions, how do we get those on the map? I can just go into my plot map see the different layers of images we have, and define where it is that we're going to be doing this type of work. So you can do one location or many, and those will superimpose over top of the entire site map once we place this and get it on issue. Field requirements go away once we satisfy them. So I'm going to go through and finish the plant and work requirements here. This is where we're adding our detailed scope of work for the hot work we're doing. One thing to note, I misspelled things and it gave me the little squiggly underlines there. So it has spell checks. You don't have to worry about legibility, things like that, uh, as something that could be a potential issue on your permits or other isolation tags or things that are going to be defined as part of the safe work process. You also have your hierarchy. This can come directly from your CMMS. So I can just navigate down through the filters and choose the correct equipment. I could also search for those equipment uh, and make sure it's something that I have, have, have quick access to as I'm trying to find the assets or equipment I'm working on. If you think about SAP or Maxima or other ERP integration, your maintenance system will help choose all this information for you. All right, so then you really just need to make sure the details are accurate, the scope is prescriptive, and of course, the hire is filled out. So that's what we were talking about for our risk assessments. And you can see how this is just a subsection that's an inherent part of the workflow process as we're building out these permits. 
So you have three sections here, our work categories, hazards, and controls. This is your library of what are we doing, what are our work categories, what are our work activities or our tasks, what hazards are related to these tasks, or in this case, related to our plant item. And as these are filled out, how do we expect to control these hazards? We're happy to share this library for you, library with you, and you can modify as necessary. But at the end of the day, this is something that all of our customers can update, manage, modify, and configure to be entirely specific for their sites. So if I wanted to define the work categories for this particular work order, I have all of these different groups here. So you can define what the groups are as we're trying to manage and update this information. I want to look at my hot work examples. I could say maybe this is something where we're just going to be using portable grinders. Maybe we're just doing some general work, right? Maybe we're doing this in a confined space or doing lifting. So there's a lot of different tasks that you can add into the work categories here. And as we add these in, it drastically changes our evaluation of this job. So instead of having to go through your permits, tick the boxes for all the various controls we want to implement just from an off-the-cuff conversation of these permits, we now have something that's consistent. We have something that says, hey, if you're using portable grinders, these are some common hazards that you're going to see based on this type of work. Not all of these are going to apply every time, and that's okay. Because I still have the ability to say, you know what, we actually don't have to worry about uh, electrical cable failure in this place because it's running off battery power, right? Or something of that nature. Um, and that will adjust your controls. Along with that, if I want to see what controls are related to these hazards. I can highlight my hazards and see, all right, we have tripping hazards. You can put up barriers. Uh, try to make sure we're keeping these to minimum lengths to reduce tripping hazards. And maybe there's some other work execution or other functions we have to do along with this. You can also add any controls. And one thing that you can rest assured with is if you're ever missing any controls in this library, because this is something that you're going to build throughout the entirety of using a system like EPATH. It's continually going to improve based on feedback you get into the system. So that's one of the big advantages, one of the ways that digital risk assessments can make this safer, is you can continually add to this. But if you are missing something, I can write in a new control and make sure that we constantly have an accurate picture of everything we're doing to adequately evaluate the tasks we're performing, the hazards associated with those, and what are we going to do to mitigate those potential hazards. And throughout this process, we're kind of taking a, a <clears throat> the opposite approach that we often see on site. Oftentimes, people just skip straight to what paper do I need to, to perform this job? What do I need so that if I get field audited, I have everything in place? But this is taking a much safer approach and saying, what type of work am I doing? What, and then letting the system dictate with your input what hazards and controls need to be are present and need to be in place to work safely. So it's pulling again from that collective knowledge that we discussed earlier and making sure that the user isn't left to make decisions that could affect his or her safety. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you can see how this is plugged in. We're going to see a little more, a couple more examples later on how this can change what you have to do, what permits you need, how that drives the workflow, just like Derek was stating there. So this hire really acts as a, as a brain trust or a library that's going to help you determine what are the safe work requirements we have for this work? And how, is, and how are we going to facilitate this to other users involved? And then before we move on, there's a great question that just came in. We see all the questions coming in, but we're answering some as, a, as a time is appropriate. Uh, is the library pre-filled when you buy the solution, or is, it added only, uh, or is it only added as you build your own library? And the answer could be both. Of course, we have libraries of these that are uh, you know, pertinent to industries, but Oftentimes, customers will have these pre-filled. Oftentimes, we will help build these out with the customer uh, using our knowledge and expertise in our collective databases. But um, the answer could be if you currently have this information, as some customers do, uh, we will upload that and improve it if necessary. But if you don't, no worries. That's part of the process. That's exactly why we're here. Mm -hmm. 
All right, very good. So I'm just going to finish with this final residual risk assessment. This is optional, uh, something you can do as part of your permitting process or something you can reserve for more formal team-based risk assessments. So I can enter my level of potential consequence, also the likelihood of something happening, and it'll give us an overall risk ranking. And this can directly affect what we might see. So now we've satisfied all of our requirements. We can now click in the top right and go directly to our new state and we're going to see our requirements are going to change. So that leads into our next point that we wanted to talk about with respect to how is digital permitting going to affect us and is this safe? Is something around approvals, handoffs, uh, and expansions. So throughout the permitting process, there's a lot of different approvals. There's a lot of handoff points. And even once we get all the approvals, handoff points in place, we might need to just change the scope of the permit once we're out in the field, right? This could be something that we may not know the full scope of what we're doing or what we have to achieve until after we troubleshoot or after we open up a pump or something else in the field. So when you're on paper, that's something where you're relying pretty much solely on your training. Uh, if you have a physical explanation along with your permits on who needs to be involved and when, so not only are you relying on the risk assessment or other check boxes to be filled out properly, but those are going to directly affect how that person is going to define who else do I need to sign off on this job, right? So let's take an example that's, that's common across all industries, right? For confined space entry, that almost always, you know, especially in chemicals, especially in oil and gas, especially a lot of other uh, industries that are particularly hazardous, when you're doing confined space entry, you need the entry supervisor or the entry attendant to also sign off on that permit for it to be a valid. All right, now take it a step further and just think about what you would have to do on site. What if you're introducing hot work into that confined space? What if you have to do welding inside that space that you're entering? What are the requirements now? How do you validate who else can do work if you have to do two types of work within that permit or two separate permits going into the same confined space? So again, on paper, that's training. Those are procedural. So you have more procedural documents. You have more, more instructions. You have more paper permits, more physical mandates on when approvals are necessary and what roles are involved. So your process documentation grows. Your training grows. Your reliance on individuals is increased. I'm not, and we always need to rely on our individuals to be safe, but we, want to, but we need to have something else for, to help remind them when we have to follow and ensure certain safety protocols are being met. So once we've figured out these roles, now we actually have to find these people, right? What if it's a specialty approval that we have no idea where our HSC manager is on site and they're not responding on radio? One of our colleagues who's, you know, he's one of the consultants for our EPAS team now, he was in uh, mining prior to joining Prometheus, and they actually ran a time study that they spent 15 to 45 minutes looking for people on every single permit to sign on and off for approvals. So they were actually looking into digital permitting, and they were going to justify it just by the sheer fact they could reduce the amount of time spent finding and routing those types of approvals. All right, and finally, we get all these approvals routed on site. We have to expand this. Again, you're putting a lot of ownership, and we want to put ownership on our people in the field, but we, we want to make sure they're following the processes that we've designed. We want to make sure that they're adhering to regulations. We want to make sure that they're not going to get their, them, themselves or other people in unsafe situations because they didn't follow something that we had buried in process documentation somewhere. So expansion on paper. Some people just write things in, and then there's discrepancies between the carbon copy we have in the office and the copy we have in the field. And that's never a good thing, especially if something gets field audited or even worse, if there's an incident. So this is something that can really be made safer and really be made more efficient when we're talking about handoff points, revisions, and other approvals in a digital system. Number one, every change that you make in the system is logged at all times. These are all routed and logged against a username to make sure that you have the right permission in the system, 
to make sure that you have the right authority to perform that approval. And those approvals are based on content. It's all driving back to the HIRA, making sure that we're mandating these approvals to the right personnel for the right types of permits in the right situations. So then as previously stated, because they're more consistent with an electronic HIRA, our approvals will be two. So that HIRA is giving you a lot of trickle down effects. Your handoffs, they're digitally routed. We can have push notifications, we can have emails, SMS messages. There's a lot of ways to make sure that our users are alerted both when they have to approve or also when they're receiving this permit. Another handoff point that common gets forgotten about is, well, we have our permit set, but you know, our maintenance personnel, our contractors, they're waiting forever to get these permits. We can actually send push notifications to those users once a permit's ready for issue so that they can come to the control room to get their permit only when they're needed instead of waiting hours and hours to get those different types of documents. Finally, if we have to expand this permit, we can follow a revision within the EPAS system. It makes sure that we're following those same workflow, workflow protocols and procedures to get the right revalidation if the scope change is significant enough to require new approvals or new content in addition to All right, so let's go back to our EPAS system. We're going to stay within the same permit to work here. We're at our planning complete stage. This is when these two new tasks that we have, these two new requirements, they're at our approval state. So if we review the approvals that we have in the system, we can say because we had medium risk, we have a medium risk approver or authorizer in the system. So a person with the authority to approve that level of risk in this area of the plant, we'll get an email, they'll get a push notification saying permits work 4475 needs your review. It's not something where I have to physically chase down Derek, find him on site and get him to physically sign that piece of paper, right? He can review this, he can walk this down, he can meet people in the field, he's alerted, he can then place his digital signature within this system. He could also sign directly on and say, I'm going to approve this particular permit. We also have our permit issuer. So the person writing this, maybe they aren't able to do those different types of approvals, even if they have the authority to do so. So it's something where we're able to mandate this information and change it as necessary. And to answer a question that's shown up here, uh, this workflow, and, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, but this workflow the question is about having this being changed to match your organization's way of, of handling work. And this absolutely is 100% easily configurable for even different types within an organization. For example, I could have a minor works permit that requires two or three uh, levels of approval. I could have a high voltage isolation that requires many, many levels of approval. And we'll talk about isolations and lockout tagout in a minute. But uh, to answer your question, this is absolutely 100% uh, able to be changed based upon your way as an organization and even uh, different areas of your organization to answer another question about dual area authority requirements. 100%. Um, so we appreciate those questions. Keep them coming. Excellent. Excellent. So our permits approved. According to our workflow, we can now go to ready for issue, all right? So this workflow can be changed to match any way your organization's handling their work. Uh, just something to keep in mind. This is, of course, just an example of how we've seen it handled similarly for other sites. So the reason this ready for issue state is really useful is that handoff point where, you know, we want maintenance, we want contractors or someone to come accept this and, and formally sign on to this job. So I click ready for issue, that can send a push notification, an email alert, or something to say, hey, you can come, come to the control room, we're ready for you, we can talk about this job and update it if there's anything that needs to change. So that can send out some of those communicating issues. Derek's now, he's, he's here on site, he's ready to get the permit, so I'm going to say, all right, let's issue it. One of the cool things that you can do, this kind of goes back to some of the risk assessment things we were talking about, is if you're being consistent with your risk assessment and the hazards you present, 
you can configure the system to automatically prompt you if there are potential hazards that are in direct conflict with one another in the same area I'm attempting to issue work. So I'm saying we're grinding, right? So I have dust and hazardous schemes in a hot surface, and those same two hazards are already in place in the same area from another grinding job. So maybe this is something that's okay. Maybe this is something we need to change our, our PPE, right? Maybe this is something we need to change our controls. So simultaneous operations, this is in all industries, this is something that's really difficult to manage when you're on paper. So EPAS, you can have immediate benefits for how you can improve safety just by the type of recognition you get with the hazards you're going to be walking into before you perform that joint, joint walk down to evaluate the job between the safety person and whoever's doing that maintenance, right? Instead of wasting our time, right? Because we had a non-starter where I'm introducing a hot surface and we're releasing flammable gas, we're just not gonna be able to do that job, right? Or we're gonna have to introduce some other really heavy controls that might make it infeasible for that particular time period. It's a really great way to prevent issues before they even become one. Uh, saving on travel time, wrench time, or even if you have potentially hazardous work happen, happening simultaneously in the same area, you know, it gets rid of the temptation to perform work and kind of push through in crowded environments and working potentially unsafely. So having that type of visibility is important to keep everyone safe and not waste time finding things out and finding out surprises when you get there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we'll continue on to the point of issuance here. We've acknowledged and updated all of this information. You can have electronic signing on to the particular permits. This can validate if they have the right training, the right qualification. So not things we're specifically pointing out, but other touch points you have in this safe work application just to ensure not only is this person aware of the hazards, but they're qualified to handle these type of hazards, this type of job. You know, let's say we've seen all too often in several industries, right, in manufacturing, for example, we were going on site and someone wanted to ensure that people had the right fall arrest training before they're getting working at height, right? A lot of requirements state you have to have fall arrest training to wear certain harnesses every few years to be able to get those types of permits. And you're just relying on honesty of the individual or the supervisor being very organized and knowing all of his personnel. This is just giving that person the comfort and peace of mind to know, okay, yes, this individual has had the training, they have had the qualifications to do this type of work. So then to answer another earlier question on how do we handle the uh, some requirements in several industries around posting permits at a job site, there are a couple different options. So in, in some industries, that's not a hard rule, right? So pulp and paper, we're doing some fully digital uh, trials here to make sure that we're able to issue these permits directly to a mobile device. With this, you can also print out these physical documents after you've gone through the workflow. So it's giving you all the benefits, all the retention, all the knowledge sharing, all the approval routing, all things like that that you're able to define, but you can still print out an actual paper document uh, to make sure that you're getting the right the right information posted at site. And also, just to answer another question that came in, you know, contractors, they don't have computer access. Can you allow for printing physical signatures? Absolutely. That's a pretty common practice that we have, especially if you're really heavily involved with contractor management, right? Making sure that we have this capability of of physical wet signatures on a paper document. And while on the topic of contractors, uh, absolutely what we're going through with the printing and, and posting to answer those two questions, but something that we briefly mentioned before as well is uh, before Sean signed in, you, know, you could still see that there were options on that home screen. You could still see that uh, he had options for recent permits, for viewing things. And then when he logged in, he saw more information. We call that kiosk mode. Before anyone logs in, uh, you're able to see information so contractors could view valuable information from a searchable uh, computer system in a kiosk type environment. 
Uh, we feel that's important because anybody that steps foot on the plant floor or steps foot out in the field affects the safety of his or her uh, or the people around them. So um, with that, kiosk mode is, is hugely important to get contractors information as well as what we're showing here with the printing and the physical printing of, of uh, paper permits. All right, so you can see the approval sections, the digital logging, those are date and time stamps. You can also he see here some blank spots for some wet sections. All right, so the advantage you have too, just to talk a little bit about the expansion. While we're on issue, a lot of this information is not editable, but you always have the ability to do more and modify. And this will allow you to create revisions directly based on what we're seeing in the field. So you can do this through the mobile app, you can do this through a tablet just on the website. You have a lot of different options to get this type of revision history while we're copying all the same information. But now we just need to edit the HIRA, right? We just need to update what has changed about this job. Why is it something that we need to redefine? So I want to move on into energy isolations and lockout tagout processes. So energy isolations, these are always a huge point of concern when it comes to safety. They're some of the most dangerous things that we're going to be doing on site often. Energy isolations, they're, they're critical to any safe work management system. So these require a lot of diligence, lots of training, lots of consistency, especially if you're managing them on paper or in some other system. Right, things to think about and where, where we've seen these processes break down if you're not using something like EPAS or another non-systemic area is how do we store these change process and how do we implement these isolations, right? So think about can the necessary people access the same isolation list very quickly every time they need to prepare work? Or is this something where, you know, our users are trained and they just know the isolations they have to do? Sometimes that's okay, sometimes it's not. So another, this is actually another mining example. One of our earlier customers in EPAS, they wanted to implement this to help improve their isolation process. One of the very first users they had was one of their senior operators, did a lot of their lockout tagout control. He was trying to implement energy isolation. The system would not let him progress. He's like, ah, EPAS, you know, it's not working, it's broken, what's going on? Well, the trainer, the subject matter expert on site was like, hey, you're missing seven of these isolation points. Like, where are the other tags you were supposed to get on this validation? He's like, what other seven isolation points are you talking about? Well, it turns out this guy's been isolating this piece of equipment improperly for several years because he wasn't aware of a change that happened on site due to a project. They had no management of change, no retraining, <laughs> Luckily, no one was hurt. There were no you know, errant startups or anything like that, but it's something that is commonplace, and that's really unfortunate because that's where we can have some really, really severe incidents. So another scenario kind of on top of the project is, you know, if we have a register of isolations, we have a good list, everything's approved, everything's great, but then we have a CapEx project. Who's responsible for changing those? How do we search those? How do we know all the isolations that were affected? So I, have a, I actually have a personal experience with this. I, I used to work in, in metals and some steel manufacturing prior to Prometheus. We had a project to reroute some of our, our water systems to try to be more efficient with how we were operating on some of our D-scale. And we, we missed updating some of the energy isolations, the controls, as a result, when we went to test this, one of the operators missed a step because they didn't go off the new process, they went through the old one, and we ended up blowing a 36 inch water main. And that flooded our basement for several days, it brought the plant down for several days, we lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in production. So there's a lot of really easy examples to talk about with this, a lot of stories we've seen on site. On top of this, in a digital system, there's a lot of interlocks, a lot of safety processes you can put in place, like making sure we don't issue permits until isolations are verified, or removing isolations until all of our permits are closed. So 
Think about things like that when you're talking about isolation management. Digitally performing those, there's definitely a lot of safety and other other advantages when you're talking about doing this in a digital system. So let's look at another EPASS example. We're going to stop with this permit we were just using there. I'm going to go find another one. So on this list view, these are just recent permits I was performing. I can see here this red icon, right? A lot of icons, you're probably not familiar with what they mean, but when I go into this permit, I can see we have a relationship requirement. And there we see that icon again. So based on how we filled out this permit, we can see number one, it actually needed a formal risk assessment. So this was a severe enough, risky enough job where we needed an actual team-based evaluation separate from the permit to work process. So kind of closing the loop, you can still keep a lot of those separate if you require. But we're also requiring an isolation certificate or a lockout tagout. So based on how I filled out the HIRA or the equipment I'm working on, EPAS is warning me, hey, you need to you need to isolate energy before you're doing this type of work. This is not something you can safely do while the plant is running. So you have the ability to look at cross-referencing to link potential on-issue isolations. I could find other existing isolations, or I could create one from scratch. Now, the benefits you have with a system like EPATH isn't just creating things from scratch, but it's using templates. So there were some questions earlier about templates around risk assessments. You can absolutely template a risk assessment. You can template literally anything in the system. I can template a permit. I can template a lockout tagout. I can template a confined space entry procedure. Everything can be templated and reused, and that's a huge area of efficiency and also safety because we're more consistent and we know where to find the approved copies. So if I wanted to use a template, I'm going to go search for ones that I've created against that equipment I've already defined. So I'm going to take this particular isolation certificate template, copy this to the certificate I was just creating, and now all my field requirements are gone. I have descriptions in my notes. I know the dates based on the permit I have. If I go to my isolations list, I can see all the different points that I've defined, the isolated conditions, restore to conditions, how many locks I need, the notes I have for how I need to isolate this type of information, any potential voltage values, where these are on site, the sequence, order I have to do this, procedural steps, all that information can be pre-populated and then subsequently modified from here if this is going outside of the already approved template. And, and you know, for, for those of you in the plant maintenance realm, I like to, to make the comparison for templating to task lists and SAP PM or job plans in Maximo or other CMSs have similar functionality. It not only greatly decreases the time it takes to plan this object, it also increases the accuracy because you're pulling from what's approved, what's accepted, and what's been proven as accepted in the past. Absolutely. So I'm just going to very quickly go through my approval workflows, get to a point of issuance here. Have Derek give me the A-OK -okay to use this particular template. So when I go towards isolate, it's going to ask what lockbox I want to use. These can be configured in your system to be coded with different lock sets, if that's something that's commonplace throughout site. And you can automatically print tags. So you can print danger tags. You never have to worry about handwritten tags being illegible or something that we have, no, or, or even worse, something that's not tagged. So we just see locks out in the field. We have no clue what these are related to, why these are isolated, what we're locked out on. So I can have a checklist to print out. As I'm placing these, we can see the content here. This is just what will be printed on your tag stock. Right, so you still have your red and white or whichever colors you mandate at your site. We got several industries that have a variety of different tag colors and tag stock they have to work with, and we can work with a variety of different tag stocks as well. But with that, you can isolate and verify. So you can have two separate users verify these. One thing you can do with the Prometheus mobile solution is you can verify all of these tags in the field. So you can barcode scan those tags, 
make sure it's something you're getting field validation with. One thing we're doing to really improve the safety of this verification process, uh, again, for a mining customer, is they want to scan the equipment they're isolating and the tag. So essentially, you have a field tag and an isolation tag. So you're guaranteeing that this person was at this physical location to validate that this has been isolated properly. So a lot of really nice ways to improve the structure and how we're trying to define the issuance and approval of this type of information. On the relationships, you can see here, now we have these two parent documents helping to control this permit, and you can relate other permits and create an entire network. Building on templating that we talked about earlier, you can template entire shutdown scenarios. So if you think about working in with some of the other areas of the Prometheus platform, you may have remembered from earlier in the presentation, you know, this can coordinate with other applications to ensure we have isolation packages that match up with how we're intending to execute shutdowns, turnarounds, and other outages. If anything changes, I can search for any of these templates. So I might say, you know what, we changed an area of the plant or we changed an isolation. I can search for one or many and see all the templates that have been affected by these points being modified. So it really simplifies the maintenance and upkeep and management of change process you have anytime isolation points or other documents change in the field. The last thing I wanted to talk about is how does feedback change digitally, right? Prometheus Group, we're really trying to improve our offering as a platform that can integrate with your asset management process. Safety is a huge part of the asset management process. On paper, this is a very siloed experience. You might get your work start via email. People will often will just come on site and say, hey, I need permit for X, Y, Z. We fill that information in, verbally mandate whether we're doing that type, of, that type of job, and then we file it away. We don't really look at this and improve this unless we have an incident. Digitally, this work is integrated. The safety is integrated with your schedule. It's integrated with your mobile solution. Your permits have questions to help you improve the system and updates. You have quick searches to help recall information. Uh, and your feedback can be integrated directly to your schedule. So there's all types of areas that the Prometheus platform can help expand what you're able to do from a solution standpoint. And just to really quickly show you, since we're running, running short on time here for today's webinar, I can go directly from my work order list. We can see ePass here. We have safety applications here as well. Let's say I'm a supervisor and we're moving a work order that was not planned for this week into the schedule. I'm going to take this, review my first task that we have, and from that task, I can create a permit request directly from this task or operation. So we're able to help begin our safe work permit planning process before we arrive on site. We can digitally communicate with our safe permit work, safe permit writers or operations folks to make sure that they have a clear picture of what is coming on to the schedule and if this is something we can feasibly achieve with our other simultaneous operations. So this is just giving you a quick peek at the mobile front end, what this looks like with respect to ePass, tons of offline implications, lot of, lots of really great features that you have with this solution. And we'll have other webinars here in the near future to really dive in more around other areas of the Prometheus platform and mobile as well. So hopefully you've seen today that digital work permitting is safer, it's more efficient. It, it has a lot of trickle-down benefits outside of current systems, including how do we track these, how do we evaluate permits, how do we manage risk, lockout tagouts, training processes. And just make this something that's more incorporated into our, our overall asset management process, right? We want to make sure that this platform of solutions is constantly talking with one another uh, and something that we're not trying to put on an island. We don't want to isolate this type of information. So with that, we're going to take the remaining couple of minutes here and try to get to a few more of the questions that we haven't responded to already.
Yeah, we certainly appreciate all the questions that were asked. We definitely won't be able to get to all of them in the time remaining with the number of questions that came in, but we'll make sure to reach out directly. Uh, we're just going to take a couple seconds here to, to uh, get a couple of these questions answered on the webinar, but don't worry, we'll be reaching out directly as well. Just give us one second. We're scrolling up to the top of this list. It's it's very long. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one of the first questions is, uh, does the process need to be initiated from the SAP PM work order? Third-party contractors who need work permits don't always have access to SAP PM work orders. So how does it really work with that? That's a great question. And as you've seen, I didn't initiate my work permitting process from SAP. I did it straight from the web application. There, you, you do have the ability to integrate with your work management system, but it is not a requirement of EPASS. It's something we've seen tons of benefit from, but it is not something that you have to do. Yeah, and that actually uh, begins to answer another question we have down the list about uh, where does that asset hierarchy come from? Does it come from SAP plant maintenance, Maximo? whatever system you're using. And the answer is it absolutely can. Uh, we would encourage integration that we offer to the system of records so you have that live update of your asset tree. But something unique about ePass is you also have isolation points that you may not want to have in your asset structure inside your CMMS. So ePass has the ability to integrate directly with it, get those updates, but also have additional points such as those isolation points that will not reside back in, in your system of record. Yep. So we're gonna do one more and then we'll respond to the rest via email. Next question we had on the list was, do you need to use the permitting and isolation solution with the mobile solution? Or are the real digital permitting advantages found when you use the mobile solution? So that's a great question and it all depends on what your goals are and what you're allowed to do with your regulations. So many of our customers that have implemented Prometheus ePass will use either just permitting or just isolations as a starting point. And they're still printing out a lot of their documents. Now they're still using the mobile solution because there's a lot of benefits to adjusting and evaluating this type of information in the field. But if you want a fully paperless solution, you absolutely have to get the mobile solution to work along with it. And I only say that because you can't guarantee you're gonna have network connectivity everywhere. ePass is a web application, so we want to use our mobile solution in tandem with that. That's a native application to ensure that you don't lose anything if we go offline. All right, so with that, to wrap things up, a lot of, this is the last question we're going to answer. It's how can I get a copy of this presentation? This presentation and recording, that's going to be emailed out to everyone who registered for the webinar, uh, so you should be getting that within the next next three days. Um, so hopefully by, you know, by the time you get back from the weekend, you can send that out to all your friends. Got a great webinar to, to rewatch. And, you know, if you have any more questions beyond this, please reach out to us. We're happy to do a more personalized demonstration or understand more about what your goals are from the safe work or, or digital safe work management system. So thanks again. Really appreciate you joining us and enjoy the rest of your days. Thanks a lot, everyone. We appreciate it.